Of course. Okay. This uh, meeting is being recorded. <laughs> okay. We are officially recording. And with that, I think we can get started. So hello and welcome um, to everyone attending in person and online to a workshop in accountability and finance uh, hosted today by Oiko St. Andrews. Um, we are here at the Gateway Building uh, in St. Andrews. Um, and we are thrilled to be hosting this event in collaboration with Oikos International, the St. Andrews uh, Economic Society, the Transparency Task Force, and Violation Tracker. So uh, yeah, thank you so much for tuning in. We're really excited for the agenda that we've got going on today, and we hope you learn something new. So with that. Definitely. Hi, everyone. Um, so what's going on today? Um, well, I'm sure Madeline's already said Welcome, thank you all for coming today. Um, what we're going to do today is start with a, a, a brief overview of Oikos International and um, the work at Oikos um, in St. Andrews is doing. Um, we're gonna hear some introductions from our wonderful speakers joining us today. Um, we're gonna have a few presentations, firstly um, by Andy Agathangelo from Transparency Task, Task Force, one of the organizations that we're having this event with today. Um, then we're going to have a presentation from Eleanor Godwin um, from Good Jobs First and Violation Tracker. After those um, talks, we're going to have an interactive workshop led by Stephen Snyder um, from Oikos International and us in the Oikos and Andrews team. Um, we're going to gather together after that workshop to discuss some interesting insights about um, our data that we found um, using um, the violation tracker resource and yeah, have some really great discussions about what that means um, for now and the future. And then um, Anne-Marie Borg, one of our speakers, will give us a call to action to really put into perspective what this, what this, this event has been about and what we can do as as students and as everyone on this call um, in, in our future. And that will we'll come to an end uh, with a thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> great, amazing. Well, we're really, really excited. And um, yeah, this is such a pleasure to be running this event with so many amazing organizations. So we're so, so excited that we could all collaborate on what we've got uh, planned for today. So with that, uh, we'll start, like Alicia said, with an overview of Oikos International. So for all of you tuning in who are here in person who aren't familiar with Oikos, what is Oikos? Oikos is a global nonprofit founded in Switzerland in 1987 uh, with the mission to transform economics and management education by empowering students, raising awareness for sustainability, and building institutional support for curriculum reform. Oikos has over 50 chapters worldwide, all working for the same goal to integrate sustainability into their educational programs. So that said, who are we at Oikos St. Andrews? We are the 48th chapter. We are actually the first, we were the first chapter uh, in the UK. Um, and with over 50 registered members, we are one of the largest Oikos chapters worldwide. We were reinstated in 2021, right after COVID and now have grown and we are proud uh, to hold full chapter status as of October this year at the legislative meeting. Uh, so that's really, really great um, to see our chapter have grown so much in the last two years. And uh, just like all Lakers chapters, we believe sustainability in business management and economics are essential elements for a better tomorrow. But we put this to practice by honing our entrepreneurial spirit by encouraging our students in our town and our university to lead and draw attention to responsible, ethical, and sustainable ways of living, acting, and conducting business. So we really focus on corporate sustainability here at Orico St. Andrews, and that said, a lot of our projects and initiatives revolve around corporate sustainability, sustainable finance, business, everything like that. Uh, and we have had the pleasure of participating in several international uh, events and programs. We were at the ICC last year in Austria, and this April we are going to Copenhagen. So we're really, really present in the international space, and we're really, really uh, excited to uh, 
um, show you guys what else we've got planned and run and spread awareness for issues that we think are really, really important. So today, that brings us to what are we doing today? Yeah, so I mean, it would let, um, as you said before, um, this is a massive partnership between some really great organizations. And so as I was sort of talking about in our introduction, um, I think what we just, the aim of our workshop later um, after the speakers is to really investigate the current situation of corporations and um, and analyze um, using the violation tracker to, to anal tracker to analyze um, these corporations and sort of do what we can and see how we can hold corporations um, accountable and to advocate moving forward for you know, progressive, purposeful change and just transformation in the business and finance sector and sustainability. Um, and yeah, I think we just really want you to, to give this exposure so that everyone here can be inspired and, you know, let's act as a catalyst um, to, to, to do our own research and be the change that's needed. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So really excited to give you guys uh these tools so you know they're at your fingertips at your disposal so that you can really be uh an active change agent and uh, this transformation to a more sustainable future exactly. that we're all for. <laughs> so uh of that we will introduce our speakers so your student hosts today are myself my name is madeline bruce i'm the president here at oigo st andrews and then we have the lovely Alicia, yeah. um, who is the head of events at the St. Andrews Economic Society. So with that, um, on to our star speakers for today, who we are so, so grateful to have. First is Andy Agat Angelo. You may uh, recognize him um, from our Oikos Academy event that we held in November, where we had the pleasure of looking at uh, corporate sustainability and the role that higher education can play in dispersing that message and educating the uh, change agents of tomorrow. So who is Andy? If you don't know him, he is the founder of the Transparency Task Force, an international campaign group dedicated to fixing the financial sector. TTF speaks truth to power, providing the challenge and scrutiny the sector needs in a noble and necessary endeavor to get it to serve people and the planet. He's also the chair of the Secretariat Committee to All Party Parliamentary Group on Personal Banking and Fair Financial Services, where politicians and peers collaborate to improve the workings of the financial sector. He is also uh, the chair of the RSA's new Financial Services Network. The RSA Fellowship is a unique global network of change makers, enabling people, places, and the planet to flourish. And he's also chair of the Violation Tracker UK Advisory Board, who we will see and in, get introduced to uh, this evening, uh, which, is a biz, which is busy promoting awareness of the groundbreaking database of corporate infringements, including the kind of violations that have a disastrous impact on the environment. So Andy holds multiple, multiple roles, and we are so uh, thrilled to have you here, Andy. So thank you so much. Moving on. Well, I have the pleasure of introducing um, Eleanor Godwin. And she has, she is currently um, um, doing a PhD program um, by the Economic and Social Research Council, um, um, and for the the long, um, amazing certification is the Northwest Science Social Science Doctoral Training Partnership. And so, this PhD looks at how corporations can be held accountable um, for corporate ecocide. Um, and this is one of the first projects um, to to sort of have this really deep dive to start systematic overview into you know the state of environmental regulation and and also the international um, legal mechanisms. And this again is with you know with the theme of accountability, making sure that you know the eco side law is put into place to prepare. Um, and challenge what lies ahead. Um, Eleanor is also the outreach coordinator for Violation Tracker, um, and Violation Tracker is one of its kind. Um, it's a tool that we'll be um, using later to um, to sort of 
as Madeline was saying earlier, earlier, you know, enable everyone to see um, to see what's out there, a structured um, platform to to um, hold organizations yeah. accountable. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it is, it is we're going to see impressive. what kind of you know business organizations are getting up to that isn't so good, and also talk about how we can put a stop to that. So uh, moving on, uh, we have the lovely Stephen Snyder, who you also may recognize uh, from our Oikos Academy event. He is the head of sustainable finance at Oikos International um, and overall is a sustainable finance practitioner from the Caribbean. He was born and raised in Jamaica and moved to the U.S. for college um, and is now starting a master's in global development at Harvard University. Uh, he works for several sustainable investing startups and empowers investors uh, to consider the environment and society in their investment decisions. So I always like to say Stephen is the guy for sustainable finance. We are very lucky to have him here today uh, to share in our enthusiasm for this subject and spread awareness of all the kinds of amazing tools and resources that he's got for us. And our final speaker today, um, oh, I love that transition, um, is... <laughs> no, it's very it's, it's, it's perfect. It's, it's the perfect, perfect way to introduce this, yeah. Anne-Marie. Yeah, yeah Anne-Marie Borg. Um, she is, well, I, I, I don't know how I'm going to do this justice, but um, she is a visual artist, uh, photographer, composer, musician, singer, performance coach, environmentalist, educator, and speaker for ocean preservation, climate change, and education reform. Um, Anne-Marie is the founder and director of the Antara Project, um, French, and French and Swedish Extraction. She has a DES qualification in business and international comparative law. And she has experience in opera performance and music history. Um, Anne-Marie is also a Transparency Task Force ambassador um, and, support, and supporting group for the resurgence, the ecologist. With a combination of creativity, self-esteem, inner strength, focus, courage, commitment, empowers us to tackle the change that need, that's needed and, lead, and leads to a happier state of being. And this quote here, in the stillness we seek, there lies an inevitable motion called change. Thank you for that, Anne-Marie. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'm so excited. Yes, Anne-Marie will be giving us a call to action at the end, which I'm very excited for. Um, alongside some of her beautiful uh, photography. So we're really excited to have her here um, and wrap things together today. But before we get to the end, on to the main event, um, I, it is now my pleasure to get things rolling, hand it over to TTF, um, and then on to Violation Tracker, and then on to our activity. So thank you so much, um, Andy. I will pass the virtual mic to you now. So I'm going to stop sharing our screen. Um, and Andy, I believe if that's all good. You have the reins. So go right ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. It, it's really wonderful to have an opportunity to speak to uh, young, progressively minded people um, my talk today is going to be very different to the sort of things I normally talk about. Um, I'm going to try to, in just the 10 minutes that I've got, I'm going to try to uh, distill a little bit of wisdom from my life experience, particularly aimed at the, the youngsters amongst you. And we're going to start off by thinking about a particular song. It's a song that um, many of you will know. I'm sure the, uh, the image on the screen I'm assuming you can see the screen now. I'm sure you recognise that image. It's for the uh, it's Queen, the band Queen, Bohemian Rhapsody. It's a fantastic song. The reason I'm mentioning this song is because there's a few lines in it that I personally find to be profoundly thought provoking. Profoundly thought provoking. And to be specific, it's these lines just before the song ends. Nothing really matters, anyone can see. Nothing really matters, nothing really matters to me. And when I think of those lyrics, 
it immediately makes me ask myself the question, what really does matter to me? Is there anything that really matters to me? And I would encourage you to think the same thing. What is it that really matters to you? What is it that really matters to me? And with that in mind, what I'm going to do is talk about this. Um, it's, it's the idea of becoming happy on the inside and on the outside. The idea of becoming happy on the inside and the outside. Allow me to elaborate. What you're looking at here, of course, is a spectrum going from very, very, very sad to you know, moderately happy to happy to kind of, you know, ultra, ultra happy. And I want to talk to you about the two green faces, the two happy ones. The first one I would characterize as being happy on the outside. Happy on the outside. And the second one I would characterize as being happy on the inside and the outside. And I'd like to offer the idea that in so many ways, we're all trying to move ourselves towards a position where we are truly happy on the outside and the inside. And I think as I'm approaching my 60th birthday in December, after almost 60 years on this planet, I think there's a bit of a wall between the idea of being happy on the inside and the idea of being happy on the inside and the outside. And I haven't quite decided what to name that wall. We might call it, we might call it the wall of woe the wall of woe, or we might call it the ceiling of satisfaction. And the idea of the wall of woe or the ceiling of satisfaction or whatever it is we eventually decide to call this, this wall, is that there becomes a limit on how happy you can be just being happy on the outside. And we can think of this in terms of the next slide, which is where we discuss the relationship between achievement and fulfillment. Now, what you're looking at here is very simply the vertical axis is relating to achievement and the horizontal axis is about fulfillment. There's a huge difference between achievement and fulfillment. Up until a few years ago, I never, ever, ever thought about things to do with fulfillment. I was only ever tuned into achievement. What can I earn? What car can I buy? What house can I have? What promotions can I get? All these important, necessary things that are essentially to do with the outer self. And my, my thesis, my idea that I'd put to you is very simply this, that most people spend their time getting to a point where they are moving their way up their achievement ladder, not paying much attention whatsoever to what matters inside, really not paying much attention whatsoever to what's happening inside. And that's why you can get people who on paper are really successful. They may have the kind of job you aspire to, the house, the car, all the trappings of success, yet you can tell when you meet them, they are completely unfulfilled. They feel empty. They know that something is missing. They're happy on the outside, but they're not happy on the inside. And what sometimes happens, it doesn't always happen, but what sometimes happens, and this is what's happened to me personally, is that there comes a point where they start realizing that they need to look elsewhere for their happiness. And that means finding happiness from inside. And they may or may not head towards that top right-hand corner, happy on the inside and happy on the outside. And my message to you today is, particularly the youngsters amongst you, is to avoid making that massive mistake. It's an enormous mistake. Because if what you want to do is to get to the top right-hand corner, go straight there. You don't need to take a detour. You don't need to spend your entire careers achieving success on the outside at the expense of success on the inside. And I think that's a really, really important life lesson. And it's what I think is the best possible use of the 10 minutes I've got with you today is to articulate that particular message. 
and it does have it does have some sort of practical applications. The question, of course, becomes what is the secret to fulfillment? And I'm not pretending I know the right answer, but my response to that question right now, having given the thought I've given to this, I think the right answer is the word giving. Um, giving is where it's at. Giving gives a sense of inner satisfaction that nothing else can really, really compete with. There's something quite magical that happens when you give. What is it you could be giving? You could be giving your time, your effort, your passion. You could be giving yourself. And what should you give to? Well, my answer to that question is you should give to whatever you really believe in, whatever that might be, whatever really matters to you, whatever you really feel purposeful about. And the idea of living with a sense of purpose is, of course, profoundly significant to all of us. We all understand this. I think this idea is captured best by this quotation from Mark Twain, the two most important days in your life are the day you're born and the day you discover why. And Stephen will remember, I'm sure, in the first conversation we had, it became the, the centerpiece of the conversation we had because we were keen to understand what it what made each other as motivated as we are, as, as committed to, to the causes that we have. And it's summed up there. And I think this is all helpful. Um, what could you feel really purposeful about? Well, it might be something that is unique to you. Of course, it could be something completely unique to you. It could be something that's part of a collective cause. It could even be something related to what we are discussing today, tonight. So my request, very simply, in helping to sort of set the scene and the tone and the mindset for the rest of the evening is this. Please open your mind and your heart to what today's speakers cover. Maybe within all of it, there is something that will guide you to becoming happy on the inside and the outside. And think of this. Think about enlightened self-interest. Enlightened self-interest is a philosophy in ethics, which is really all about the idea that persons who act to further the interests of others or the interests of the group or groups to which they belong ultimately serve their own self-interest. I think the Transparency Task Force is full of enlightened self-interest. I think Oikos and the community that you have internationally is also filled with a sense of self-interest. And it's this kind of thing that has the potential to achieve happiness on the inside as well as happiness on the outside. I've squeezed as much as I possibly could into the 10 minutes that I've had with you all today. And I've really tried to go somewhere quite deep and quite personal and quite elemental. Um, I hope I've given you something to think about. Please just remember that axis. Achievement is one axis. Fulfillment is the other. Please don't lose sight of the importance of fulfillment. And if you can start thinking about fulfillment when you're in your late teens and early 20s, that's wonderful, because I didn't even start thinking about this until I was in my 50s, so you'd be many, many years ahead of me. There are another 14 slides, which I'm not going to go through. They're all pretty self-explanatory. When they're circulated, just jump through them. It's self-explanatory. Um, if you want to get onto the Transparency Task Force's uh, mailing list, please, please let us know. That's cool. And my very final two words are very simply, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, Andy, thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing and a lot of really good things to think about. Um, and I definitely recommend that you guys check out the Transparency Task Force. I think Stephen will put some links in the in the chat. Uh, I get the Transparency or Transparency Times in my inbox every every Tuesday, and I always look forward to it, especially the the thought of the week at the very end. Uh, which is always a pleasure. So always get, like, encouraging us to think a little bit deeper um, amongst uh, 
all the bad and find the good, I guess. So thank you, Andy, very, very much. Um, and I believe now it's my pleasure to hand it over to Eleanor for our main introduction to the violation tracker. Really exciting stuff. So thank Eleanor, you. thank you, Andy, and Eleanor, take it away. Hi everyone, it's so lovely to be here today and thank you Andy. I can honestly say having had a corporate job and having left it to get much less pay on a PhD, I am more fulfilled than I've ever been. <laughs> so um, yeah, I can totally wholeheartedly go with you on that. I'm just going to share my screen now. So... Okay, so I well, today we will be investigating corporations and their sustainability, ethics and morals, um, which I'm super excited to be here. It's something that is re I'm really passionate about as a researcher. Um, basically, my entire job and thesis is about pulling apart corporations and seeing how sustainable they are, how ethical they are, um, as well as looking at the laws and regulations alongside that. So. It's really multifaceted, the area that I'm in. Um, by training, I'm a corporate criminologist um, with, I'm currently in my final year um, of my PhD at the University of Liverpool. Um, and I'm an outreach coordinator for Violation Tracker, which is fabulous. And I cannot wait to show you um, the tracker. Andy is a big fan. We work very closely with TTF. We're very lucky to have such great backing from them. Um, so I need to full screen this. Um, so yes, today I thought I would talk you through some of my favourite tools for investigating um, corporations um, and show you my little checklists and then the activity at the end will involve going away and doing some of it yourself. I don't expect you to be able to do all of it within this set time period, um, but yeah, just being able to get a feel for a corporation and be really critical about corpor what corporations put out there I think is is really key. Um, so why investigate corporations? Um, why do I do this? Why do I enjoy doing this? <laughs> um, it's such a wide area um, and it can encompass so much and you can feel overwhelmed, especially when looking at bigger corporations. So really it puts the power back in your hands as the consumer um, or the client. You know, if we look at banks, it's, um, it helps us make informed choices about where we shop, the brands we buy, the banks we place our money with. Um, you know, I'm, I bank with NatWest and unfortunately they are one of the biggest violators and violation trackers. So it, it, it is making me rethink my choice about where I put my money um, and ultimately where we shop. Um, you know, it helps, gives us some form of agency again it's about putting power back in your hands um it's about seeing through the um very polished very fancy pr and marketing campaigns that these big corporations often put out there um and it's really seeing what stands behind that what stands behind their mask who who really are they if we're being critical um and again, being critical is key for pushing for a more sustainable and transparent world, which I'm sure we, you know, the reason that we're all here tonight is because we want a more sustainable uh, and transparent world and business environment. Um, so, yeah, let's. OK, so when I'm doing this work, um, what are my like go to tools for um, stripping back corporations. So Companies House is a very basic place to start, really, um, but it gives you a lot of detail on a company in a very, you know, formal sense. Gives you a history of the company, who the current people are in charge. You can then, you know, who the directors are. You can see who, where else the directors operate, what other corporations they are, you know, heads of or secretaries of. But it also lets you look at their company accounts and filings, which, I mean, going into company accounts is a, a beast in itself. It's it's an entirely different seminar in itself. But, you know, uh, violation tracker, of course, UK and US. Um, I might be the outreach coordinator for the UK, but the US is just as good a tool. Um, and sometimes, you know, we over here as regulators don't regulate as 
I don't want to say as much or as harshly, but there isn't as much regulation over here as maybe there is on the US um, side. So it's great to look being able to compare US and UK violations. Um, it's open access, which I'm very, very proud of in the UK. Um, it's free to use um, and it helps you see how many enforcement cases a company has had against them. Um, usually this kind of information I know from my first couple of years doing my PhD before the tracker was actually launched and before I found out about them. Um, this would normally require a freedom of information request and having put in so many freedom of information requests and been drowned in data during my PhD, I would have loved to have found this tracker sooner. <laughs> <laughs> um, it would have taken a lot of stress away from me. Um, so it enables to see um, who the offenders are, how often they're offending, how they're penalized, how much they've been penalized. We'll have a look at that. Um, Zero Tracker is a, another free tool um, to look at a company's ESG summary and see how weak and strong it is. We all know that pretty much every corporation these days puts out some form of environmental social governance summary um, again it's part of their shiny PR and marketing campaign um, ethical consumer I've recently discovered this one but I really like it um, it has a free area but I am a subscriber now but I it was only something like 20 pounds for the year to subscribe and it gives you so much information on a company's ethical rating from their environmental impact to impact on people and animals as well, which, you know, um, is it, it really is very in-depth. And the Moral Rating Agency is fairly new. Their main project is looking at corporations that are still operating in Russia um, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine and to see how moral these corporations are. Um, so that's sort of still in development and i know that they will be pushing that development further to beyond um that project to look at to give you a rating of a corporate models more generally so those are really like five key tools that i look at when i'm looking at a corporation so this is my little checklist toolkit that i put together um for you guys today um, so the first thing I do, if I have an idea in my head about a company that I want to research, I will go and look at their website. Um, I will look over their annual report and usually this incorporates these days their ESG um, report. I will Google the company because I like to see what the press are saying, both mainstream and the smaller press outlets that sometimes are more critical. Um, so you've got byline times are very, very good. The conversation um, and a few others that I can't think of right now, but they are all excellent smaller media outlets that are really good at giving you sort of real information on companies. Um, I search companies house. I then check violation tracker in the UK and the US. I check zero tracker, I check ethical consumer. So yeah, that is my process. Um, so I thought today I would spend the remainder of my time giving you an example, a working example, um, which will involve splitting between web pages. So I thought I'd use HSBC. Huge corporation, I'm sure everyone here has heard of HSBC. Um, they are one of the lions of giant, uh, you know, of banking um, globally. Um, and yeah, I've done some investigations in the past and they're, yeah, we need to look beyond their very shiny PR. Um, so that is skipping ahead a little bit. Let's see if I can go to tabs I already have open. So I'll just make this easier for myself today. I thought I would get these tabs open and ready. Um, so first things first, I would Google a company. So I don't really need to show you how to Google something. Um, well, I, I will go into companies else. Um, we'll go on that in a second. Get a feel for their website. You know, what are they doing for the environment? How are they being sustainable? They've got on their website a lot about their climate strategy, a lot about financing net zero, playing a leading role in the in the transition to net zero um 
you know, biggest impact we can have is by working with our consumers to support their transition to lower carbon emissions. All sounds brilliant. Um, why we do it? They've got a chief sustainability officer, as most big corporations have. Um, Excuse me, Eleanor. I'm yes. Sorry, are you sharing your screen? I think we're only yeah. seeing your presentation right now. Oh no! You should be seeing my. You should be seeing a web page. Hang on. Oh, this is the screen. Oh, okay. Technical problem. I'm very sorry. How do I change the screen that I'm sharing on? Oh, okay. Here we go. Very sorry about that. No, that's not helpful. Here we go. Can you see that? Yeah, we're seeing it now. Thank you so much. Okay, brilliant. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, no problem. Maybe you want to just quickly show us how you found the company house. Yes, so I will do that. So company's house, so we can Google company's house search um, and it gives you the, and you go on the government website one um, specifically. So when you go on uh, company's house, um, you will obviously come to a search box. If we type in HSBC, I know that their predominant company in the UK is their holdings. Um, so if we go on to HSBC holdings, so HSBC holdings, PLC, you can see how many different HSBCs there are. Um, they have a very, very complex corporate structure, which again could be an entirely different presentation in itself. Um, so this gives you an idea of where they're registered, their head office, um, company status is active. They're a public, they're a PLC. So they are publicly traded on the stock market. Um, so yeah, uh, this gives you filing history as well. So we can go into the company accounts from here, which again would be an entirely different presentation in itself. Um, but if we wanted to go and have a look at their profit for the year, um, we can do that from here. Uh, so yeah, it's a really, really great database. It's very, very in-depth. Um, so yeah, just going, so if we then go back onto their website, which I was thought I was showing you guys, my bad. Um, you'd think in this day and age I'd be, over not being able to, you know, have Zoom issues. Um, so financing net zero, that's all their corporate talk, all looks very, very nice, very, very shiny. Um, and if we find their annual report on their website, which again, to save time, you can Google HSBC annual report and it will give you the web page, which in order to save time I have done. Um, you can doubt, because it's such a big report, some corporations do this, you have to download various aspects um, of the report. So in the interest of, will this let me new share screen? Right, hang on. Okay, so this is looking at the, that's their shareholder information, but yeah, so anyway, if we go back to my, so yeah, their, their annual report, will show you all our ESG stuff um, and Again, so I have also looked at, and in, sorry, in December, they put out a statement saying that they are to end funding for new oil and gas fields, which it was very impressive. I believe a lot, it got a lot of people talking, um, you know, in line with the Paris Agreement, et cetera, et cetera. They wanted to make themselves look very sustainable and this, possibly um, did this quite well. Um, so if we then 
when I'm trying to operate so many tabs at once. Um, so if we continue on to violation tracker, let's have a look at violation tracker, which is my favorite thing to do. So HSBC, you can do, so this is the home screen of violation tracker. It shows you, I think it's 50 odd regulators now, and it will be well over 77,000 cases, but it gives you a very good overview of corporate violations, um, which I think is a very important part of sustainability in the future, especially, um, you know, environmental violations, which is something that I look at in particular. So we can go down to parent company summaries, um, which SBC. So if we go on to here, we can see again, it summarizes that they're publicly traded. Um, you know, they have a total number of 16 cases um, since 2010 is when um, Violation Tracker UK goes from. And they have a whopping since 2010 total penalties of 298 million pounds, which I think we can all agree is a substantial amount in fines since 2010. So all of a sudden their sort of very sustainable shiny facade is looking a little bit less um, sustainable and shiny. Um, so this is great for that. We can, if we wanted to do a more in-depth search for them, we could do an advanced search, look them up. We can even look up the prime minister at the time to see what violations happened under certain prime ministers, which for the environment agency and other agencies is very interesting. Um, we can mirror the same on violation tracker US. Um, so again, if we did a search of violation tracker US, um, we can again do, it's a very similar way of operating. We can again do HSBC. And this time under US violations, we can see since 2000, they have had a huge 6.5 billion um, penalties and violations with 63 records. Um, so again, the steps that we saw to begin with when we looked at that shiny facade, it's all of a sudden looking less shiny. Um, they have, yeah, they're, they're looking less ethical, they're looking less moral, they're looking less sustainable. Um, if we then go on to net zero tracker, we can again um, get onto a home screen where we can type in the company um, and see how sustainable or not they are. So, We go on to companies. So when you go on to Zero Tracker, you'll see the little company sign up here. So if you click on that and scroll down, um, we can search by company name. So if we put in HSBC, HSBC gives you a nice summary of their sustainability, their ESG targets. So we can see here um, that they have a corporate strategy. It's not a declaration or a pledge, it's a strategy, which that um, is a very nuanced language. Um, they don't cover all of, you know, it's, it's CO2 only. Um, they don't present historical emissions. So this really gives you a lovely summary of behind the scenes of that shiny annual uh, report on that annual uh, ESG report. So we're getting the picture that they are uh, recidivists, they violate again and again. Um, their ESG report shows that they're not actually that sustainable. Um, and then we can go on to ethical consumer, um, whiz over to ethical consumer, um, and we can look again, is HSBC ethical, which I think, you know, sustainability, ethics, morals, it's all very important. Um, they invest in, they are linked to deforestation, fossil fuels, arms, military supply, which I don't think 
would necessarily be a huge shock to anybody, but this tool really lets you see the environment, the people, politics. They have an FE score, um, which the lower the score, the worse the company is by way of ethics. And you can really dig down deep into all these different areas, which um, again, just gives you such a wealth of information. Um, and the last one I want to show you quickly, although, as I said, this is really a work in progress and a work, you know, a project, um, is the Moral Rating Agency. Um, so their first project, they only launched very, very recently, and their first project is looking at the Russian invasion of Ukraine and companies that are still operating in there. Um, if you go to their news page, um, it's quite a clunky website to use. If you go to their news page, you can scroll um, all the way down to the bottom. And you'll see their various um, research outputs. It would involve going all the way down to the bottom. Come on. Right, for some reason it's not. It's, a, as I said, it's a big website and it's quite clunky to use at the moment and quite slow in places, but that's worth having a play around with. I won't show you the whole thing. Um, but yeah, it's definitely worth playing around with. Um, so, we saw before that they are, and this is why I like to Google and do media searches of companies. So they said in December 2022 that they were no longer investing in um, oil uh, companies or fossil fuels. And then in January 2023, it came out that they are under fire for investing 340 million while they're under a loan to um, an energy to a coal mine expansion so you know we've stripped away those layers and realized that they are not looking so um so great sustainably now um so i would summarize that by then doing this you know we've seen this i you can get that from that annual report um or you can again look it up um on google to see profit after tax of 16.7 million uh, billion last year um their annual report plenty of positive language about cutting fossil fuel investments but the reality check is they are recidivist companies they time and time again um violate regulatory laws um in both the uk and the us um there is zero trackers comments are there is not at this stage a commitment to decreasing oil and gas within a set time frame. The FE score was 1.5, which is very low um, because they're linked to deforestation, fossil fuels, and um, they are guilty of complete moral washing over Russia, which is a blog I did on violation trackers. So in summary, they're not so shiny, they're not so sustainable. And that's really the importance of investigating these companies. Um, and I can't sort of stress that enough. Um, so that was really, sorry, it was in a piecemeal and I um, didn't realize that I wasn't showing my screen at the beginning. Um, but yeah, that's really a whistle stop tour of how to look into and delve, you know, into the beast of a corporate of a corporation and to strip away their shiny exterior. So we're now going to move on to the activity, um, which I will hand back to Stephen for. But um, please go on to Good Jobs First and look over our blogs. And if you have anything that you're writing on or you have any questions, particularly about Violation Tracker, please feel free to email me. We love hearing about our data being used. Um, and thank you for listening. Let's make companies more sustainable, moral and ethical in the future. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Wow, that was <laughs> Sorry, really, that was a lot. Uh, no. <laughs> that was no. Eleanor, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Madeline, do you want to say anything before I jump in? Um, I think uh, we're all good from, hey. from our side. Hey. Eleanor, thank you so much for that. That was a really great introduction to some of those tools. And so we're really excited to 
put those to to practice exactly. and try some try some of them out ourselves. So with that, Stephen, would you like to introduce our activity for today? Absolutely. And I thought that was a really good example because I don't know if you've seen all of the HSBC adverts. Um, I definitely have where they claim and are really trying to show that they're thinking progressively, thinking about the future. I mean, they have like these really positive ads that talk about migration, talk about climate change, talk about plastic pollution. Um, but when you get down to it, what are they really doing? And so it's with the Oiko spirit, um, we're really going to dive deep into the resources that Madeline has shared. And I'm gonna give you all the opportunity to practice um, what Madeline has taught us. Um, to think positively and to think about impact as Andy has shared and give us opportunity to look at these resources. Um, if you are interested in collecting your research um, and uh, being that journalistic uh, investigator as Eleanor is teaching us to do, I'm putting in the chat a platform that we like to use at Oikos called Miro. Um, you'll have to connect your email address to it, but I've created a little uh, Miro board on which you'll be able to share the results and investigation that you're doing. Um, it looks like this, so you can take a look and just see what's going on, but it's a way for us to whiteboard and to talk about the tools that have been and collect this information. Um, and so before you go and, and sign up and everything, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the toolkit that um, Eleanor has provided us with from looking up the company's website, checking out their ESG report, taking a look at the company house website and going through violation tracker. I'm gonna put into the chat all of these resources. So making it a bit easier for you to do as well as giving you the opportunity to look at them afterwards. So what I would do is sort of just open them up one by one um, and then go through them with your, with your pleasure. We're gonna do about 20 minutes or so um, of doing some research, and we've prepared a couple companies that you might be interested in looking at. So I'll put this in the chat as well. These are um, a good set of companies that talk the talk, but maybe not walk the walk, but please feel free to search your own favorite brand, maybe look up your bank, as Eleanor is talking about, um, and it, it might be an opportunity to see, hey, our is this favorite company of mine actually doing what it says it's supposed to be doing? I've just put into the chat the list of uh, potential organizations that you might want to check out. Um, and I'm gonna slowly start adding to the chat the other resources so that you can, uh, can see it. Um, I'll also share some light, maybe Queen, maybe I'll play a Queen playlist um, as we sort of just start going through the resources. And then in about 15 minutes or so, I'll call us all back um, so we can share some of the findings that we're, we're doing on these. Um, do we have any questions? All right, I'm gonna take silence as that was all very clear. Um, so just to summarize, please um, check out the online whiteboard that we've created. Um, take a pick a company that you're investigating and then the resources that I'm dropping into the chat, I'll, um, I'll, I'll share. And in the interest, I'll also pause our recording and uh, play a little music. Thank you all. And with that, our musical interlude comes to a close. I hope you enjoyed the music from our guest um, as it brought you into the researching mode. I hope that was enjoyable as well. For me, it was going through all of these tools. Um, and this is our opportunity for sharing with the audience. If you feel bold enough um, or uh, have a question, I think we have a couple of experts in the room. Um, Eleanor, I'm gonna lean on you as our resident criminologist to answer these tough questions that our aspiring gumptions and sleuths are uh, bringing to you. <laughs> Perfect. I've been really impressed by the mirror board that everyone's creating. It looks great. Um, 
I mean, I'm learning from some of these. <laughs> I guess one thing that is interesting to me is just the wealth of information that's out there. And it really mm -hmm. seems that there's many different groups that are putting all of this information. Um, and, and for your job as a criminologist, looking at this, you have to pull on many, many different resources. So I can understand the point of the violation tracker trying to bring and consolidate as much of that. Um, it was interesting to me to see different data sets on the US and the UK, and then to see within both data sets, multiple different corporate entities. Um, that was amazing, so, yeah. Yeah, could you talk to that experience of how hard that must be to figure out what's going on for a company as global as Coca-Cola, for example? Yeah, so what you mean from the violation side? Um, oh gosh, it's so hard to track. <laughs> I guess I, start with regulators and with you know if i'm looking at specific areas so for example i'll always go back to the environment because i look at corporate eco side specifically as a job so it might be that i lean on the environment agency and do an fri request there um so yeah for a company as big as as coca-cola the issue for criminologists is bringing all that information together and actually finding those violations because you look through different court documents you look through you know, you look at different courts, you know, high court, supreme court, um, you look at different regulators, and it's so hard to bring all that together, whereas having that in one place with Violation Tracker is amazing. And being able to see a parent company, as well as all the, the smaller companies that go into that parent, um, is just phenomenal. Um, and that's really why I'm so enthusiastic about Violation Tracker because I wish I'd seen it like a year, like two years ago, three years ago. I wish it existed. Um, it was all thanks to Andy that it does. It was it was his push on the guys at Good Jobs First for us to have a UK version. So yeah, um, it's. But as you can see, I mean, the other databases as well, bringing together Zero Tracker and um, Ethical Consumer and trying to create that profile and really dig deep into the belly of these beasts that are these huge corporations. It's, it's an interesting job, but it's tricky. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, something that we were just talking about here at um, on the ground at St. Andrews was, again, just the amount of money that uh, these violations are costing these organizations. Mm. So it really is, you know, putting the price on you know, what it, it means to not, um, you know, be accountable and not be responsible in your business operations. You know, businesses really are racking up quite a tab um, as a result of, you know, not caring about, you know, the environment or their people or their workforce. So it really just shows the importance from a fiscal perspective, you know, what corporations have to lose. Absolutely. It's it's vast what corporations have to lose, but it has sadly, you know, those violations and those fines, they sort of have become the just the, the point of doing business, like a side effect of doing business. And that's really where we have to change the conversation, which is where, you know, tomorrow's students and tomorrow's graduates um, going into the, the business world. We need people who care, who are, you know, who care about sustainability. And it's not really sustainable for businesses to lose so much money let's be honest it's not a sustainable business model or it shouldn't be um so yeah we need those students of tomorrow to to help uh, businesses become more ethical moral and sustainable i definitely feel like we can all agree with that when we're looking at you know especially my class of students we're looking at internships and it's you know i think this has been such a great source of, of exposure to see you know, as as Andy's talk was saying earlier, like how can we have a, how can we do something that's both meaningful, um, or how can we do something that's both fulfilling and you know, and, and also have achievement? And I think that's, I don't know, like for me, just looking through all these corporations, it's sort of given me this like purpose of, um, you know, when I do eventually end up here, how can I be that voice? How can you know how? Because it really only takes that one person to be in like a, a large leadership position to make that decision and then 
you know so it's it's yeah it's been a really really insightful activity absolutely um, yeah. yeah and thank you so much eleanor for yeah. walking us through all those tools and i think a lot of us can apply those um, whether we're doing research assignments or even you know in the workplace and you know as it, anyone here is graduating or going into any kind of sustainability related career i think these tools can be really useful um, or even just you know if you're at the shops like you said and you want to you know know a little bit more now you have the ability to do so so thank you so much um, if there are yeah if there are any questions from the audience please put them in the chat, I know we are coming close to our time here. So that said, um, I think uh, we should probably turn it over to Anne Marie to close okay. us out because you know we're talking about Eleanor. You said tomorrow, talking about you know putting the agency back into students, back into young people, adults, all ages. You know, I think it, it really is about talking. You know, what's next? Mm -hmm. What do we do now? What's our our call to action, if you will? Um, so. I, I, believe, <laughs> I believe we will now, if that's all right with you, Eleanor, um, turn it over to you, and marie I'll share my screen here. Um, let me, oh, do we have enough, do we have a question? Do we have a question come in? Oh, oh. Hi, Philip, uh, please go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Hi, good evening, everyone. I, I found this a fascinating discussion because I come from a rather later generation, as probably the colour of my hair might show, uh, and I'm not about to go out and um, uh, uh, cause any great nausea, perhaps. Um, I think it's been very interesting to hear you speak, Eleanor, of the uh, tools that are available. Um, I would like to be thinking of the next stage, and it's not you young folk going into these companies because uh, you're not going to be able to do much from inside. But I think there's got to be, uh, and again, it was interesting how you developed from glossy magazine stuff from uh, HSBC into a healthy um, skepticism, perhaps. And that, uh, as Andy will know, one of my favorite phrases is corporate claptrap which you hear all the time. And we have got to remember that the stuff that is accessible in these documents and these statements and annual reports um, is barely worth the paper it's written on. And we've got to be very, very skeptical about that. And I think we've got to challenge corporate claptrap and that is getting hold of the directors and the boards of directors of these companies. Um, and uh, that is not straightforward. You're not going to be able to send an email to the chairman and say, I'd like to come and talk to you about your ESG or whatever. He will not be interested. And therefore, you've got to get in uh, through another door. And the main route, and it's a well-trodden one, is of course the annual general meeting and you've got to have become a shareholder and in fact andy and i first met each other when we went not as shareholders but as uh common garden uh citizens of the country to the annual meeting of the financial conduct authority where i was chasing them about their um constipation in trying to sort out the uh, uh um H boss fiasco and the maximization that went on and so forth and so on. And that's where he and I uh, met up. Am I right, Andy, on that? <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, it just worried me for a second. I was mixing you up with somebody else. But um, that's where we got cracking. Uh, uh, and uh, I became involved with TTF because I am not a professional uh, accountant or lawyer or anything else. I'm just an ordinary citizen and a shareholder. Um, but I found uh, things in the company uh, that I focused on. And rather like you focused on HSBC, I focused on another financial institution, probably best not to give its name here, um, and, and have focused my attention on what they have done. And I think that there are um, incredible number 
of examples of management incompetence. We do believe if these people are paid a million pounds or five million pounds, they must be absolute geniuses. Um, sadly, they are not. And they've got to be challenged. And uh, the AGM is a wonderful way of doing it. And Share Action is doing quite a lot of work on helping people there. But you obviously only get in by having some shares in the company. But they, since the shareholder spring in 2012, in the last 10 years, AGMs have become very interesting bull rings and the blood has flown and uh, boards of directors largely and particularly financial companies are scared stiff of them uh, and uh, uh, they, 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 they really are worried and um, you can go uh, virtually to many of them no get on the train and get there get inside face to face see the beads of sweat on their brow when you put your question to them and uh, I think that, that is what I would I, I, I want to tell you if you like onto the, the next stage we've got the tools now but you know all those figures in violation tracker is not making one iota of difference to the conduct of that board I'm afraid it costed in to the jobs that they're doing you've got to actually highlight on where they have gone wrong and where the regulators are failing. I've been looking at all day, I've been looking at the environmental report that has got to be done uh, on, on waste management uh, for a major company. And it's gone, uh, this report to the environment agency. And it's a selection of boxes with numbers in them, which could have probably been taken out of the old log tables that some of us might remember them in our arithmetic books. And the environment agency will say, we've got the document, we, nobody's looking at the numbers. And some of the numbers just didn't make sense. So regulation, and this is a story, of course, of the TTF, has been a subject of intense uh, activity. But we've got to recognize that regulation isn't doing enough at the moment, anything like enough. Um, sorry, I've gone on for far too long, um, but that's my concern taking it to the next step. Oh, can I just say one other thing? One great resource for um, making your point about financial companies is the Treasury Select Committee. It's one of the most greatest things in British <laughs> parliamentary life, where um, if you can get your MP to guide you into the questions that you want put to the people whose uh, feet are to the fire, like Andrew Bailey or whatever, then you can make some great, great progress. Um, at that point, I'm oh, sorry, I'm delaying things. And uh, Anne Maria's got far better things to tell us about. Oh, Philip, that was that was amazing insight, though. Thank you so much. I think you know all great, great points, and we even have some further great points coming up in the chat. So we really wish we could have the time to unpack these, but what I'm hearing is we'll do, need to do a follow-up event, mm. so I will rely on my lovely team here to coordinate that, um, to keep talking about this stuff, because it's so, so important, and this is the kind of change that we really want to see happening. Uh, with that said, I um, think we should turn over to Anne-Marie now. Sorry, Anne-Marie. Um, uh, we're short on time here so but if you could just leave us with a few of your call to action sure. words that would be amazing i will go ahead and share my screen now we'll go to the first one yes please yeah you just tell me when you want me to change slides okay <coughs> so can we have the first the first slide madeline That's okay. So this picture, oops, okay. <laughs> it's coming back. Okay. The first picture you're going to see is actually in Alaska. And I hope you're going to see it. It was a wake up call for me about environmental issues. There we are. So what we're seeing is that the wall of ice is actually melting. It's actually breaking down. And I had been traveling quite a lot with them, um, uh, talking about 
environmental uh, concerns and also uh, ocean preservation. But it was the first time that I was actually seeing it with my own eyes. And I think that's why I wanted to start with this because sometimes we imagine something, we talk about it, but we haven't seen it. And, uh, and that was a big wake up call. Madeleine, the next one. Okay, so I'm going to widen the discussion a little bit or, or, or how we look at it and talk about change altogether. If you, if you are going to choose something that you feel, as Andy said, you feel very concerned about, you have also to be realistic. What is it, what, what are you aiming for? And change can only happen with a certain, in a certain, with certain conditions. Uh, it happens when the product of dissatisfaction with the present state of things, uh, multiplied by a clear vision of what you want to actually achieve for the, for the future, and some practical steps. And usually I recommend small steps first before you actually uh, yeah, get people to think we'll never do it. And all those things need to be greater than the resistance to actually change. We all know that the fear of change and the resistance of change is what we're actually facing, especially with really important issues. It's an everyday kind of a, a situation. Madeleine, thank you. So I want to talk about empowering, whether it is yourself or other people around you. So many times we, we, we are told that we can't make a difference as individual. It's not true. We can, even if we just scratch the surface, we can. So I want to challenge this idea. Any change, important or small, came from one person's initial idea. That's why we got this picture, which is very uh, apropos, uh, Madeleine, because Madeleine put it in. Go for the moon. But now I'm going to say beware when you go for the moon. Next slide. OK. What is the main tool that we have when we take on a project? Our imagination. And this comes from Einstein. He actually called it fantasy, but that's the, that's the German word for it, uh, uh, fantasia. Imagination is, is more important to him, it's his quote, than knowledge. Now, maybe we need to balance this a little bit, but knowledge is limited. Imagination is your individual tool, your kind of idea that comes at the beginning. And in the next slide, thank you, Madeleine, we will see why I'm saying this and why it actually, I will draw the examples of, of today. Andy uh, was in a certain area working and he suddenly realized that this is not going anywhere. This is where I want actually the change to actually happen. There was something, some organization, some part of that financial system that was not fulfilling its role. <clears throat> and it was a shock. And I think, I don't want to put words into, <laughs> into his mouth, but I think it was a great wake up call. And the project started then. There comes a point, as Andrew, uh, Andy said, actually, that we cannot be silent anymore. And I think when you reach that and you see how much it actually upsets you, it's time to do something about it. Same thing with Good Job First and the violation tracker. I also have a friend who's actually has just turned her life over completely. She deals with a um, fashion industry, two little kids sitting in her living room thinking, I don't want to do this anymore the way it's actually going on. And she started creating a project about sustainability in the fashion business. She's now lecturing all over the all over England and making a huge impact on the business. It started in her imagination, her vision, small steps, but now she's onto a roll. And another one, Madeleine. Okay, my kind of uh, strength or what, what, what I want, my battle, if you want, because I'm gonna uh, ask you to choose your battles, is um, the education system. I won't say too much about it, but it's about creativity, which builds self-esteem in students and their strengths, their focus on what they're doing, the courage and the commitment they can actually have. 
to we need to empower them to actually tackling, uh, tackle the change because the, the change is coming. We cannot avoid it. So for anybody who's actually choosing a, a, a project to actually implement change and apply their vision, be creative, but choose your battles. You can't win the war, but you can choose your battles. Focus on, on what matters to you, what change you would like to see happening. The next tool is to build your support system. Families, friends, universities, organizations, anything that actually teamwork, communication, talk about it. Fill your shopping back with allegiances. You're not alone. A lot of people have similar visions. That's what I think is really important. We are not alone and we can do, we can make a difference. I'm working in a garden um, with garden. I'm a garden manager in a garden in, in London. And I've seen the system of recycling dead leaves. It's nonsense, it's crazy. I'm now writing to the council to actually tell them there is a better way of doing these things. And that's my kind of initiative, my imagination. I can visualize that this can be different and much more efficient. Thank you, uh, Madeleine. We're getting there. So we need to be realistic. We may not always see the result of the change that we start, but we can lay the foundation and other will take on the role, other will continue. This is what is called cathedral thinking. Think about a cathedral, how long it takes to build it. Look to the future, be involved, but actually uh, create, also look at your limitations. One final thought, we are change. That's who we are. Life is about change. From the minute we are created as human beings, we are changing. It's life itself. It's our creativity. Our, our, as creatures, we are change. I won't repeat the motto because you've seen it already, uh, but I will talk about this little guy down here who's actually a lovely bear that I met in Alaska. And every time I look at him, and I think I'm trying to protect your environment and your life. And it gets to me every time. So basically imagination, vision, the commitment, but also look at the limitations. Don't take on the world. It's not possible. If you want to actually change something, look at what you can change and then go for it because bring it on. It's exciting. That's it. <laughs> wow, wonderful, Anne Marie. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was beautiful. And my goodness, beautiful shots there. That was a race. <laughs> so thank you so, so much. Uh, I think that was just a beautiful way to conclude our session today. So really, really thank you so much for preparing that. Oh, thank you. Um, that's lovely to participate. I really, I love that. I love the quote, we are change. Life is about change. That, that's yeah. really set the message here. I think in St. Andrews. I think that's, that's definitely something that we can all um, take to heart, whether it's, you know, about anything from, you know, what we've talked about today, holding corporations to account or just our general everyday lives. So with that, um, I, we have uh, just a few resources um, that Stephen can put in the chat. I think he has, um, so thank you so much. And I believe if no one has any questions, um, that's it for our session today. Thank you for staying. Um, I know we did go over our time, um, but we would just like to thank on behalf of Oikos and uh, Center's Economic Society, thank you so, so much to all of our speakers, especially Andy, Eleanor, Anne Marie, Stephen, we are just so appreciative of your time and energy to make this event happen. And to all of our participants, we hope that you learned something insightful and important and are really feeling empowered uh, to create this change, um, this inevitable motion. So uh, thank you so, so much. And I believe I will leave it there. Stephen, if you want, I want to say anything else, um, I would just say thank you all for joining. Um, this is a series of webinars that we'll continue to put on for the Oikos community. If you're interested in the topic of sustainable finance, definitely reach out to me or to um, um, 
to Madeline on the on the topic. I'm gonna put my email address just so you have it in the um, chat so you can see if you want to get in touch. But at Oikos International, we're trying to provide students and practitioners with tools like these. So I'm just really grateful for Eleanor for walking us through. I thought that was a really great workshop. Um, and I hope that you will use some of these tools in your own investigative journalism, reporting and activism, um, which we definitely need. Thank you, Eleanor. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you to Oikos. It's been brilliant. And um, yeah, there was a lot to cram in. So <laughs> I hope that you all take something um, away from this. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. And thanks also to Andy and Anne-Marie for your very inspiring words, both at the beginning and the end. I thought it was a great way to wrap it together. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, and everyone have a wonderful rest of your evening. Hopefully be in touch. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye now.